All right. Good morning, Brain Turns. My name is Brendan Rue. I'm a rising MS2 at the Zucker School of Medicine. I'm here with Morgan. Do you want to say hi? Hey, guys. I'm Morgan. I'm also a rising MS2. Yeah, so we talked about the pulmonary structure back all the way back in week two. It's honestly really crazy that it's already the last week. It's really sad for all of us uh, med students because we did look forward to Friday mornings, um, being able to like talk about the human anatomy and really just teach everyone um, and discuss medical anatomy with everyone. So I just before we begin, I just wanted to thank everyone for participating and joining our sessions. It's been so much fun. Um, it's also been a great learning opportunity for all of us, and we hope it's the same for you guys as well. So shout out to Dr. Langer and Bukvar and Dr. Diamico um, for inviting us. And yeah, thank you guys. Uh, Morgan, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I'm excited for this uh, last talk, and I hope you guys feel like you've got something out of this. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to just send us an email or anything. Yeah, so more, so basically I'm going to be getting started off by talking about the vertebrae, and then Morgan's going to be transitioning into the spinal cord. So when I'm teaching, Morgan and we have some other medical students, um, hopefully, that will be help, helping out with the um, chat function. So feel free to ask questions but do try to focus on what we're saying more um, and we'll definitely have time for questions if you guys have any. So we'll dive right in. So week eight, CNS structure. Um, we'll be talking about the spinal cord and the vertebrae. Um, this is kind of a continuation from last week where Marianne and Sabrina talked about the brain since they're both part of the central nervous system. Um, like I said, I'll be starting off with the ver vertebrae, the vertebral column and I'll hand it off to Morgan, and she'll be talking about the spinal cord and lightly touch on the peripheral nervous system, so the anatomy and the physiology of it. So this is a general overview of the spinal cord. I'm sure it may look familiar to a lot of people. Um, this is the classic picture of the vertebrae. So it has five different levels, the cervical vertebrae, the thoracic, the lumbar, and the sacrum and the coccyx. The sacrum and the coccyx, a lot of people just kind of lump it together. Um, but yeah, they're five big levels and each level has a different number of vertebrae, uh, the actual vertebrae. And one way for me to memorize this is when you say cervical, it kind of sounds like seven. It's like an S sound and a V, so cervical, seven. So there are seven vertebrae in the cervical level. There are 12 in the thoracic level. And the way I memorize that is they both start with a T. Um, I tried, that's the best I got. And for the other three, it's easy because they're all five. And here, the coccyx, um, it could be three to five, depending on the person. Um, but the most important part that it's fused into just one giant kind of bone. Well, not giant, but it's fused into one bone. Um, the sacrum also is fused, but when you're born, you actually have separate. Uh, it's more separated, and as you develop, they fuse in together. And the way I memorize five is 12 minus seven equals five. So start with seven in the cervical vertebrae, 12 in the thoracic, and then five, five, five for lumbar, sacrum, and coccyx. So I know there's a bunch of anatomical terms um, on the screen. We'll definitely be diving more into it like as the slides progress, but the main point I wanted you guys to get out of this is kind of the organization, um, the number of vertebrae per each level, and the function. So can anybody tell me what the function or the many functions of the vertebrae are? Just on the chat function. Stability, I'm seeing a lot of good answers. Posture, support, protection, great, movement. Those are all great answers. Yeah, exactly. So the biggest thing is protection of the spinal cord, um, the spinal nerve roots, and also it's just like the vasculature that's involved in the spinal cord. Um, it transfers weight from the upper body to the pelvis. So it kind of supports that and is weight bearing. And it also articulates to the skull, ribs, and the pelvis. Um, we'll be talking about why that's important because that actually changes the structure of the vertebrae depending on what it's articulating with. Um, it also helps with flexion, rotation, um, rotation, and it also is a really important attachment point for the diaphragm and the pelvic floor 
uh, which I'll also be talking about later. And it's this, a lot of people don't know about it, but it's the main site of hematopoiesis, which means red blood cell making besides um, the pelvis. So it has a lot of very important functions. This is another picture. It's a more sagittal view. So can anybody tell me just because we have to get really oriented in like medical anatomy and how to describe um, orientation, which side is the anterior side? So this is the right side, left side. So right versus left, which side is the anterior side? So I see left. So you guys are saying this part's the anterior side? I see one right. Yeah, so it's actually the right side. So I would be looking at someone if they were facing me from this side. And then this would be the chest. This part would be the back and so forth. And one way to really quickly tell that is all these spiny processes, it's called the spiny process, is towards the back. And you can feel that when you kind of run down um, your vertebrae with your own hands, you can feel that there are all these bumpy processes. And that's basically the spiny processes. So you can tell that's the posterior side slash the dorsal side. And this part is the anterior side. So the main point I wanted you guys to get from this slide is one, the curvatures. So when you say stand straight or sit straight, you're not really sitting straight because your spine is curved. Um, and there are two different types of curvatures, the primary and the secondary. The primary curvature when you're viewing it anteriorly, it is a concave curvature. And one, I don't know if you guys are familiar with concave and convex. Concave, I imagine there's like a cave, like an entrance of a cave when I'm looking at it. So when I walk in, I'm walking into a cave. So the thoracic part is concave. Also the sacrum slash coccyx is also concave, you can see here. But the cervical and lumbar are convex, meaning it's curved towards you, not curved away from you. And another quick point from this picture, uh, Morgan's going to be elaborating a lot more on this, but there are different spinal cord segments slash spinal cord levels and vertebral segments, vertebral level, levels, and they don't actually match up. They're mismatched. So it's color coded here. So the blue is technically the cervical level and it matches up pretty well with the spinal cord level up until the cervical, uh, cervical level. But once you go into the thoracic level, the spinal cord is a lot shorter than the thoracic level for the, lump, uh, the vertebrae. So you see how the spinal cord level for the thoracic ends all the way up here, maybe in around like T9, yet the thoracic level for the vertebrae extends all the way down here. And Morgan will definitely be talking about that, but I wanted you guys to visually be able to have the mismatch in your head. So the different pathologies arise from the different curvature. For There's kyphosis in the primary curvature, so the concave. So this is when the concave cur uh, curvature is actually too pathologically too curved. And this can cause a lot of problems, and you would need a neurosurgeon to fix this. And lordosis is more for uh, the secondary curvature. And this will happen more in the lumbar area. And scoliosis, I think Salem and uh, Joe back at MSK talked about it, but it's when there's a curvature that's more laterally um, that's happening that can also cause a lot of pathologies. This is probably the most important slide, at least for my portion, because it talks about the general anatomy and the general structure of the vertebrae. So like I said earlier, different levels have different characteristics and different shapes because they basically have different function. And this is what I've been saying all, um, I guess all month is you gotta learn how to relate structure and the function. And obviously the vertebrae is no exception. So this is uh, the general organization and I'll be kind of going through each anatomy and then talking about them. So you first here have the vertebral body. It's like the really big bony fat uh, big area that takes up a lot of mass. And it's the main function is weight bearing. It also contains uh, red bone marrow. 
and it articulates with the vertebral bodies above and below uh, the levels. And between here, do you know what, between the different vertebral levels, what other structure is here on top of the vertebral body? Can anybody tell me? Cartilage? Um, so specifically, what type of cartilage? Disc. I love it. Yep, a lot of disc. So the disc would be in that area. There's also the vertebral arch, which means that it's kind of arching away from the vertebral body. You see the pedicles here, which are kind of the smaller uh, bridging point between this whole posterior portion and the vertebral body. So that's shown in orange. You have the vertebral laminae or, so, or the lamina, which is the yellow portion right here. You have the intervertebral for, for, foramen, which means if you break it down, it's intervertebral. So it's between the different verte uh, vertebrae and it's a hole because foramen, uh, foramen means hole. And that's something that's used anatomically all over the body. And I have a better picture for that. So um, kind of uh, hold on for that one for me to show you. The spinous process, like I said, it's the bony, it's the parts that's protruding when you kind of touch down the spine in your back. There's a transverse process and there you have two of those because you, you need one for the left and the right side and there's the articular process so this is the general structure here you see another sagittal view i honestly love this picture because it shows you exactly how the, ver the vertebrae are kind of connecting or articulating to each other so you see the vertebral disc right here supporting the vertebral body in the uh, superior and the superior and the inferior side and the main part that touches between vertebrae are the facets of the superior articular process and the inferior articular process. So the blue one right here is a superior articular process and the purple here is the inferior articular process. So you can kind of see in the bird's eye view of the vertebrae here, the superior articular process shown in turquoise and you can kind of see the purple one uh, inferiorly, but it's facing downward. So you can't really see it in this view. So this is another sagittal view. I have this picture up to show you this is the intervertebral foramen and a lot of the spinal cord roots. So I know you guys have probably heard of the dorsal root ganglion and so forth are all living here and they pass through here before it reaches like the other parts of the body. And Morgan will be touching on that in a lot more detail. So we're gonna be going through by level and then I'll be kind of telling you guys how they're special how they how you can how they're different from the general vertebral formation um and yeah so i'll be starting off with the cervical i'll be going down to thoracic lumbar and then sacral coccyx so the cervical is a little special because the there's seven of them and the first two have their own names it's a little annoying so they are they're all called c1 through c7 but c1 and 2 have specific names and can anybody tell me what C1's name could be? Perfect, Allison Axis. You guys are already experts at this. But basically the C1 is the Atlas. Um, fun fact, Atlas was a Titan God who had to carry the celestial spear because of a punishment by Zeus. I'm not gonna get into the actual mythical details, but that's one way to kind of memorize it. Your head is earth slash the world. And Atlas is the God that is holding up your head. So that's one way I kind of memorized it was C1 is the Atlas because it's holding up your head, AKA the world. Um, so one important feature, it has no vertebral body. So you don't see that massive bone, bony structure that's used for weight bearing. And that's cause it's not touching, it's only touching a vert vertebrae inferiorly. Superiorly, it has your head this base of the skull. So since, and the most uh, stable way to kind of hold your like skull base is having a more round condyle that surrounds the actual atlas. So that's what you see right here is a superior articular facet. So it's still called a superior articular facet, but it kind of goes around the circumference of the atlas. And it, so it has a much more stable way of holding the, holding the skull base. 
and this is one thing I forgot to orient you guys is the top left image here. It's basically you're looking at the vertebrae anteriorly. So I actually have this um, to kind of help you guys visualize. But if this is the head, so my professor actually got us for this during finals. It's a stress ball. And if this is the vertebrae, this is the anterior side. Sorry, the uh, it's kind of hard to see. But this is the anterior side. This is the posterior side. Superior, inferior. If it's holding the head like this, the top left image, this is what you're seeing you're seeing the anterior side towards you guys the top right image it's a more lateral view so you're seeing it like this so if the head is like this and the bottom left image you're seeing it in a bird's eye view so if it's like this you're taking out the head and you're seeing a bird's eye view of it and the anterior side is facing down and the posterior side is facing up in that picture is everybody clear because it's really important that you're perfectly orienting yourself when you're looking at these um, diagrams. So can everybody just let me know if they're good and on board? All right, perfect. Yes, that was helpful. Perfect. Yeah, so I'll be moving on. So the next one, a lot of people also mentioned it. It's called the axis. And one way I kind of memorized it, um, it's a kind of a stretch. But here you see kind of two different long, axes that are I guess I mean maybe it's just me kind of visualizing and kind of forcing it in but to me this looks like the y-axis and this looks like the x-axis so it's just easy I just call it the axis and the reason why you have this protruding part that's protruding superiorly other vert vertebral uh, levels don't have this but the reason why they have this is because of the atlas when the axis is touching the atlas superiorly, it fits in to this portion right here. So this is one thing I didn't talk about when I was talking about the atlas, but this is called the facet for dens. So remember that facet for dens. So it's a part where the dens will fit in. Fit in. So what is the dens? This is the dens. So it fits in perfectly. And it's more protruding up so that it can touch the facet of the dens in the atlas part and actually fit in. It's literally just like Lego pieces. So this is the dens. You can also see here and here in a bird's eye view. And it has the anterior articular facet. So this is the part that's touching the atlas. Also the posterior articular facet. And there's another pair of facets here called the inferior articular facet. So this is the part that would be touching C3 superiorly. So that has to be really clear and that's why I color coded it. The blue circles are the facets for co having contact with the atlas and the red circle here, there are two of these, one on the left and one on the right, that are touching the C3, the third cervical vert vertebrae. So that's really important. So this is, so from C3 to C7, it's pretty much the same, um, same anatomy. But one really special thing about the cervical vertebrae is this foramen. So we all know there's the vertebral foramen that carries the spine, uh, spinal cord and the vasculature. But there's a, there are two extra foramen just in the cervical level, and this is really important. So can anybody tell me what structure can possibly be traveling through these transverse foramen. And it's called the transverse foramen because it's surrounded by the transverse process. And this part is the transverse process. Vertebral arteries, spinal nerves, carotids, arteries. I want you guys to be a little bit more specific than arteries. I'm seeing carotid. So the answer is right here. I actually had to answer right in front of you guys. So yeah, it's partially, um, so technically you can say the spinal, art, uh, spinal nerves are protruding out, but it's technically not traveling through. And those travel through the intervertebral foramen, like I said earlier, the, sp uh, the spinal roots and the ganglions. But the part that really travels through the transverse foramen are the vertebral arteries. 
Yeah, I think some people said it. But yeah, these are the vertebral arteries that branch out from uh, the subclavian. But these basically travel up and then it will be part of the circle of Willis that will, won't get too much. I think they, uh, Sabrina and Marianne got into last week, but it's part of the cir circle of Willis that supplies it po in the posterior part. So the vertebral artery is kind of supplying the posterior part of um, the circle of Willis and the cerebellum. So these, the transverse foramen are basically protecting the ver vertebral arteries. They're also the vertebral veins and sympathetic fibers that pass through these, um, which Morgan will also probably talk about. But that is the very high yield point of the cervical level that they have this transverse foramen. Also, the vertebral foramen size wise is the largest out of the three different levels, the cervical, uh, thoracic and lumbar. And the reason why is just because the spinal cord is the thickest and it has just the most uh, inf information passing through at that point. Here it's the thoracic vertebrae. This is the classic vertebrae that I've been talking about in terms of the structure. This is the vertebral body. Um, these are the transverse process. So you don't see a foramen in this level you still see the vertebral foramen and you see the superior coastal facet for number eight. Number nine is the inferior uh, coastal facet. And do people know what, do people know what costal means? Perfect ribs. So this is where the ribs actually touch the thoracic vertebrae. So the the thoracic vertebrae is special in the sense that it doesn't only articulate with other vertebrae, it also articulates with your um, ribs. And there are 12 ribs, which is also why there are 12 vertebrae in the thoracic level. So in red, this is showing the facets that are articulating with the other vertebrae, and the blue are the ones articulating with the ribs. This is the lumbar section you have the biggest vertebral body because it's the main function is weight bearing and actually supporting the upper weight. And the spinal cord actually terminates at L1. So I showed you the picture earlier. It actually stops at L1 and the rest, it's called cauda equina, which um, Morgan will be talking about, but it's basically just a bunch of strings that are bundled up. So it's a lot thinner and it's not as delicate. So the foramen, vertebral foramen is not as thick as a cervical level here, if you were to compare the two. But the vertebral body is a lot bigger. So the ratio between the vertebral body and the vertebral foramen is a lot bigger in the lumbar section. So you still see the lamina here. You see the transverse process here. There are two of them again. Um, eight and four, I don't really have much to talk about, but it's the mammary, uh, mammillary process and the accessory process. And yeah, those are basically the main processes for the lumbar area. This is the sacral and the coccyx. It's not talked about too much, um, but it is really important. It's really calm. It's a really common side, uh, place for fractures because when you land on your butt, it's really sensitive that you may break, break your uh, coccyx and the sacrum, or even every time you have a pelvic injury, there may be a lot of trauma to the pelvic area or the sacral area. So like I said, it's, they're all fused. There are five fused here. There are three to five fused in the coccyx. And it's honestly a really important point where different muscles attach. So the, the one important area is called uh, the levator ani. It's more of the pelvic floor. And this is the part that controls anything um, in the pelvic floor. So like the bottom of your pelvis, meaning like urinary incontinence um, and just... It's also really important for uh, bearing children and giving birth for women. And another anatomical difference between men and women is that for women, the coccyx here and the sacral here is a lot shorter because you want more space in the pelvic floor for the child to come out. So it would probably, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but the coccyx may stop here opposed to men, which can actually wrap around the entire pelvic, uh, part of the pelvic floor. So for women, it actually stops a lot shorter because you need more space for delivery. So that's one kind of clinical aspect of the coccyx and the sacrum. 
I'm not going to go too much into detail of the joints, but these are the main joints that are present in the vertebral column. Um, and the main point for jo joints are for movement. So I'm going to be talking more about that in this picture. And I have a little trigger slash question for people. So there are three different big types of movements, flexion and extension, lateral flexion and extension, and rotation. So which vertebral levels from cervical, thoracic, and lumbar? So your sacral and coccyx can't really move. Um, so out of those three levels, which ones can do flexion and extension, lateral flexion, extension, and rotation? And I'll give you guys a couple seconds to kind of think about it and write it on the chat. So which ones can do flexion and extension? Let's start with that one. Thoracic, lumbar, thoracic and cervical. All right, now for lateral flexion and extension. Thoracic, cervical, thoracic, perfect. Now for rotation. Cervical. So I saw someone wrote cervix. Cervix is very different. So when you have to say cervical. Perfect. So the answer, I, I could see how you guys are actually trying to think and figure out this problem. But the answer is that for flexion and extension, it's mostly cervical and lumbar. So not thoracic. This is one I off also, when I first learned this, would have imagined the thoracic vertebrae to be able to do this but it honestly can't because you have the ribs. Because you have the ribs, it's limited in terms of motion because whenever you flex down, you don't want all your ribs to be collapsing. So the thoracic part is actually really stable in terms of flexion and extension. And it's mainly your cervical and your lumbar area. And that goes the same idea for the lateral flexion and extension. So the one thing the thorax, the uh, thoracic area, level is really good for is rotation. When you're rotating, the vertebrae can actually rotate, but it just can't uh, have flexion and extension because of the ribs. So the cervical and lumbar, so cervical is the most mobile. The cervical is basically, it can do all three. The lumbar area can do flexion and extension, including the lateral parts. And the thoracic part is the part that can do the rotation. So that has to be pretty clear in your minds. And you can definitely go back in the slides and go through these. These are basically the ligaments and the ligamental structures for the spinal cord. I just wanted to show you guys, it's divided into three different levels, the anterior, middle column, and the posterior column. And their main function is to limit the movement of extension and flexion. Because if you don't have these, and the vertebrae can move as much as they want, it can actually damage the structures it's trying to protect. So the ligaments are kind of the safety net that prevents from these extra movements from happening and protecting the structures that it's supposed to. And one ligament that I want to talk about is the ligamentum flavum, flavum. I'm not sure how to pronounce it correctly, but this is the ligament that keeps your upright posture. So this is a ligament that's crucial for having you kind of sit or stand upright. So it's, it's going to be a quick case. Um, I'm going to kind of quickly go through these because I want to give Morgan enough time. So a 57-year-old woman with no significant history presents to your spine clinic with a chief complaint, chief complaint of chronic lumbar pain that worsens when she uses the recliner. So when she's trying to sit down and recline backwards, it gets worse. She used to be an ex-Olympic gymnast and is still very active. And the patient also notes mild urinary incontinence. So when you, took, when you take an x-ray, when you're in a spinal clinic and everyone becomes a spine surgeon, and you look at the sagittal view, you could see how there's mismatch. It should be all lined up like this. But there's mismatch in the lumbar area. And you can actually measure using tools that doctors use and actually grade how bad this pathology is is and this when there's a mismatch and it's misalignment it's called spondylolisthesis 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 it's kind of hard to say i encourage everyone to try to say it but people just call it spondies so i'm more used to just calling it a spondy 
but there are different grades from one to five, depending on how much displacement there is uh, from where it should be aligned. And that's really important uh, because it's really common. This slide, I just wanted you guys to understand, just like the brain, you need vasculature to the spinal cord. Uh, back when I first learned this, I just assumed that there was blood somehow, and I didn't really understand there were spinal branches into um, the spinal cord, and that's also very well protected by the, by the vertebral columns. And they mostly branch from the thoracic aorta. So this is the big aorta, so from the heart. I know you guys did this a while back, so I have to refresh your memory. There's the ascending aorta, there's a the aortic arch, and then there's a descending aorta, and that becomes different levels as it travels next to your vertebral column, and it travels on the left side anteriorly. So you could see here. And there are branches called a posterior intercostal artery. So intercostal meaning in between the ribs. So these are all going to end up in between the ribs that branch out from the aorta. And that's going to further branch out into the spinal branch. And the spinal branch provides the posterior part and the anterior part of the spine or the spinal cord. This is, I just wanted to show you guys, you could do angiograms for the spinal arteries as well. I just thought this was really cool. Um, because mainly endovascular procedures are for the cerebral arteries, but you can do endovascular procedures for the spinal arteries. So for an example, if you have a spinal artery AVM, um, arteriovenous mal malformation, you could embolize that by going through the spinal artery and endovascularly. So there are procedures where you use the spinal angiogram. This, I just wanted to talk about the disc very quickly. It's in two layers, the nucleus pulposus and the annulus fibrosus. So annular meaning it's more ring-shaped, so it's surrounding the nucleus pulposus. And does anybody know embryologically what becomes a nucleus pulposus? If you guys have taken basic embryology, you may have heard of this term. Perfect. I knew someone would get it, notochord. So the notochord is a really crucial part in embryology, but it doesn't, people kind of forget what it becomes when the person fully develops. And it's the nucleus pulposus. That's one thing that would impress a lot of professors or doctors if you, if you know the notochords becomes a nucleus pulposus. So that's a quick clinical pro right there. Um, and I'm sure you guys have heard of disc herniation. These are just, I'm just wanting to show you guys how there are different types of herniation. You guys can definitely check this uh, slide out afterwards. And they're different, they're, you gotta be able to anatomically describe them in terms of where they're protruding or prolapsing. There's the anterior part, there's a the lateral part, there's the foraminal part, which protrudes into like the foramen. So if it protrudes to the foraminal part, what would it protrude, protrude into? What structure? What lives in here? Right, the spinal cord roots. That's where it could protrude into. And the central part where it could protrude directly into the spinal cord and the subarticular part, which is kind of in between the central and the foraminal parts. So these are just T2 axial MRI images. You see here, it's protruding into the foraminal part and then pressing on to the, the roots, the spinal roots. This specifically is pressing onto the dorsal rural ganglion, opposed to here where it's protruding literally into the spinal cord. So that would be more of a central protrusion. So now I can hand it off right into Morgan. It's all, the floor is yours. All right, guys. Uh, so I'm going to be talking to you about the spinal cord. Um, so just to, to start off, I think the spinal cord is kind of difficult to understand without talking about the physiology of it. The anatomy is kind of difficult. So I'm going to be touching on the physiology, but try and just take in the anatomy for right now. And if you guys have any questions about physiology, I'll try and touch on that. But um, it is kind of a complicated subject. It's like a really long brain. So just bear with me and... Uh, yeah, let's give it a go. So here we can see um, two views of the spinal cord. So the middle is a sagittal view. 
um, similar to what Brendan has shown, and the right is looking at it from a posterior view. And who can tell me kind of like what the main purpose of the spinal cord is? Okay, good. So I see some sensation. I see some protection. So I'm talking specifically about the, the spinal cord. We're not talking about the vertebrae anymore. So yeah, so I see transmission to and from the periphery. That's perfect. Motor and sensory. Great. Yeah, so the main function of the spinal cord is to relay information from the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system. So a spinal cord is um, considered part of the central nervous system and it communicates with the peripheral nervous system. Um, so the spinal cord originally um, originates from the medulla oblongata, which is part of the brainstem, um, and it travels all the way through the vertebral canal like um, Brandon was talking about earlier. And so similar to the vertebral bodies, you have five segments of um, the spinal cord. So you have the cervical region, you have the thoracic region, you have the lumbar region, uh, the sacral region, and the coccygeal region. Um, so there is one thing that's interesting. So we have um, eight cervical spinal nerves, 12 thoracic spinal nerves, five lumbar, five sacral, and one coccygeal. Can anyone notice kind of what the difference is between the vertebral bodies compared to the spinal nerves? Okay, I see cervical, cervical is eight. Yeah, perfect, that's, that's the really big difference here. So there are seven um, cervical vertebral bodies and there are eight cervical um, spinal nerves. So as you can see on the right image, the spinal cord is kind of like the trunk and the spinal nerves are the branches coming off. So we have in the cervical vertebrae, we have the spinal nerves come off above their respective vertebrae. So your C1 nerve is coming in above your C1 vertebrae. And this continues down until you reach the thoracic vertebrae. And then at the thoracic vertebrae, your C8 is going to go um, below the C7 vertebrae, and then your thoracic vertebrae is going to be above the thoracic nerve. So it goes from the spinal nerves being above the vertebrae to below the vertebrae, and that continues down all the way to the coccygeal. Um, I hope that is not too confusing for everyone. It's kind of just orientation for where each nerve is respective to their vertebrae. Um, two, two enlargements to note, Brennan kind of talked about this, but the cervical spinal cord is the largest, thickest section of spinal cord, so you have this enlargement here. Um, at the, the top of the middle diagram, you can see the big enlargement of purple. And so that, the reason that's so large is because it's supplying a bunch of nerves to, it's called the brachial plexus. And the brachial plexus is um, innervating all of the upper limbs. So you have a lot of nerves and a plexus um, is just a network of nerves. So you can see on the left here, Brendan's pointing to it, um, the brachial plexus is just this network of nerves kind of like by your shoulder and collarbone that's supplying all of the nerves for your arms. So you're going to have a thick spinal cord because it needs to uh, it needs to supply all of those nerves, and then you also have the lumbo lumbar sacral plexus, um, which is supplying your legs, um, and it's the same idea where there's an enlargement there um, in the lumbar segment of the spinal cord because it has to supply all of those nerves. Um, and so Brendan mentioned it earlier, but the spinal cord doesn't actually go the full length of the spine. So it actually stops at L2. Um, and then it turns into what's called the cauda equina. Does anyone know what cauda equina means? Yeah, yeah, we got it. So we have some Latin speakers in the audience. Um, cauda equina in Latin actually means horse's tail. So if you look, it looks like when the spinal cord ends at L2, all of these strings kind of come off 
because the spinal cord is ending, but the nerves are continuing down. They, those nerves still have to go to their respective levels. So it looks like a horse's tail because it's becoming very stringy um, and all of these separate nerves are bundling together to form these strings. Um, and then at L2 where the, um, where the spinal cord tapers off, that's called the conus medullaris. So that's the, that's the anatomical term for that, that end right there that Brendan's pointing to. All right, we can go to the next slide. So for this case, um, it's pretty vague. We have a patient presenting to you with lower back pain, muscle weakness, and numbness in his legs. Um, and the patient had an MRI showing the following. Go to the next one. So what do you guys notice about this MRI? We're looking at a sagittal view. Can you guys notice anything about the spinal cord? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay, so I see some, uh, some people mentioning spinal stenosis and compression, and that's perfect. That's exactly what it is. Um, stenosis is another word for compression. So anytime you see um, stenosis, it's a narrowing of something. So this is considered spinal stenosis, and it's actually due to a herniated thoracic disc. Um, you can see it, yep, right there. And so you can see that this herniated disc is really narrowing the spinal cord. And if we look back at the patient presentation, um, the patient is having pain, muscle weakness, and numbness in his legs. So he's experiencing not only pain, but also motor weakness, so an inability to move his limbs, um, and numbness, which is the sensory. Um, so compressing the spinal cord is really going to affect all of those, those uh, portions of the spinal cord, which I'm going to talk about a little bit further. Uh, you can go to the next slide. All right, so now we're, we're digging deep into the spinal cord. We took the spinal cord and we sliced through it, okay? So we're looking at it from top down. Can anyone tell me what side they think the anterior side is? Perfect. So I'm seeing some the the bottom the bottom of this image is the anterior side, and the top of the image is the posterior side. Just to orient you guys, so we're looking down on the spinal cord. We cut it in half, um, and I think the the first thing that you guys can notice is this like butterfly looking thing here. Um, so the spinal cord has two types of tissue. It has the gray matter and the white matter. The gray matter is what's making up that butterfly. And the reason it's gray is because it's, it's darker because there are more cell bodies in that area. And then the white matter is where um, nerves travel and their axons are going up and down the spinal cord. And axons, you guys might know, are myelinated. So they have myelin sheaths, which are more white. Um, so that's why you kind of see that, that butterfly there. And um, one important thing that you guys should know is these two roots that are coming out of the spinal cord. So you can see there's one dorsally called the dorsal root and one ventrally called the ventral root. And they're originating from different spots in the spinal cord and they're coming together to form that, that spinal nerve that we had talked about um, earlier, the 31 spinal nerves that exist. So these dorsal roots and ventral roots have two different purposes. The dorsal root is um, specifically made up of sensory neurons. So they're bringing in all of the information from the nervous system, from the peripheral nervous system. So another name for sensory neurons is afferent, spelled with an A. Um, so they're the afferent sensory neurons. And those allow you to feel, um, have pain sensation, have temperature sensation. Um, they, all of your sensation comes through there. So, and then your ventral root is actually made up of the motor neurons. So those are called efferent, um, spelled with an E. And that's what actually allows you to control your body. Um, so those are anything that makes, that allows your body to move um, is a motor neuron. 
And I'm gonna, I'm gonna dive into this a little bit deeper. It can get a little confusing, so just bear with me. Um, I'm gonna go into this a little bit more, but that's a basic overview. Um, and then you guys can notice this little kind of lump on the dorsal root. That's called the dorsal root ganglion. Um, and that's what Brendan was talking about when um, he said that travels through the intervertebral foramen. Um, so that you can kind of picture how this segment is going in through um, like the vertebral bodies and how these kind of interact with the vertebral bodies. And really the, the vertebral bodies really provide that crucial protection for, the, for this structure. All right, we can go to the next slide. All right, so now we have the spinal meninges. And just like the brain, um, the spinal cord has these meninges. Can anyone tell me what the three meninges were from the brain that you guys learned about last week? Perfect. All right, so I see pia, dura, and arachnoid. So we have going from inside out, so closest to the spinal cord, right, right on the outer border of it is the pia matter. Um, and it's a very thin membrane covering the spinal cord. The arachnoid um, is the middle layer and the dura is the most external layer. And these meninges are really important in providing more protection for the spinal cord. So they contain the cerebrospinal fluid, which is called CSF. Um, so the cerebrospinal fluid lives mainly in the subarachnoid space. So that's the space between the pia matter and the arachnoid matter. Um, so if you look on this diagram, um, you can kind of see the arachnoids in purple on the left and the pia is in blue. So the CSF would live in between those two layers. Um, and on the right, you see kind of an axial cut um, and you can see kind of the, the space there as well. Um, and then in between, uh, right outside of the dura matter is in between the vertebral body and um, the dura, you can see kind of a fat pocket, it looks like. Um, and that's actually where they put an epidural. Um, that's called the epidural space. One last thing to touch on is on the picture on the left, you can see kind of a little hole in the middle of the spinal cord, and that's called the central canal. And that also contains CSF and it acts as a shock absorber for protection. All right, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so a patient will need a lumbar puncture to receive a diagnosis of meningitis. And meningitis is a bacterial infection that can be seen in the CSF. Um, and a lumbar puncture is when a needle is inserted into the spinal canal to remove the CSF. Based off the anatomy of the spinal cord that we just discussed, what level do you guys think you would want to insert the needle at? All right, so I see a lot of L3, L4, L2. Why are you guys saying that? Can someone give me a, a brief explanation of why you think that's the right spot? Perfect, so I see answers coming in that the spinal cord ends there and that is exactly what we're looking for. So when you're doing a lumbar puncture, you can go to the next slide, Brendan. When you're doing a lumbar puncture, the goal is to get CSF, but not hit the spinal cord. Because um, obviously we don't want to be shoving a needle into the spinal cord, which could injure it. Um, so you want to do it at the point in which the spinal cord ends, but there's still a reasonable amount of CSF. So that's going to be between L3 and L5. And um, since the spinal cord ends at L2, you have the spinal nerves just kind of floating around in the CSF after that. So the saying for this is to keep the cord alive, you puncture between L3 and L5. So that's kind of a little helpful trick to remember. Um, so you can see on this diagram, the needle has to go through all of these different layers um, in order to get to the subarachnoid space, which is where the CSF lives. 
Um, we have a question, why not do it at L5? Um, you can do it between L4 and L5. That's one of the more popular places to do it. I think just because the spinal cord, the, the subarachnoid space tapers down, it's gonna be harder to, to get CSF out of the anything below that. So you wanna aim for L3, L4, or L5. Okay. And we can go to the next slide. So this slide here is really for your benefit. Um, so just try and after this lecture, try and look it over, take it in. It's a little bit confusing. Um, so I'm just gonna run through these diagrams with you and then you guys can try and absorb this on your own. So if we look at the top left diagram, we have sensory on the left, motor on the right. Like I said, sensory is called afferent and motor is called efferent. Um, and those are leaving. Um, so I like to remember it by remembering that efferent starts with an E and that means to exit. So it's, it's the same letter to kind of remember that. So in these two different categories, you also have the categories of somatic versus visceral. And somatic really is any voluntary, any voluntary either motion or um, uh, senses that you have. So the visceral responds to, the visceral means it's only organs that you, that are not voluntary. So anything touching an organ. So if you have a pain coming from your stomach, that's going to be a visceral sense um, compared to a pain coming from your skin or a muscle, a voluntary muscle, that's going to be a somatic sense. Does that, does that make sense to everyone? It's a little bit complicated, but those are kind of, that's how you break down the different nerve types. Um, and then looking at the nervous system as a whole, you have what we've talked about, the CNS. So we've gone into detail about the brain and spinal cord. And then you have the PNS, which is divided into the autonomic nervous system, which is the involuntary stuff and the somatic nervous system, which is all of the voluntary stuff. Then you can break those down further into sensory and motor, and you can break the autonomic nervous system down further into the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. Um, does anyone know what the sympathetic nervous system is? If you can give me a catchphrase for it, that would be perfect. Fight or flight. Yep, perfect. That's what I'm looking for. So sympathetic nervous system is just your fight or flight reaction. Um, and parasympathetic nervous system is called the rest and digest system. So it's when you're relaxed. Um, and so those two are really how the autonomic nervous system is split up. And then you have motor and sensory neurons in both of those as well. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So this slide is really just to show you guys that the sympathetic nerves have a little bit different of a course than normal than other nerves. Um, so the sympathetic nerves actually go through the sympathetic trunk. Um, and these are, it's basically just two, a trunk that lays laterally to the vertebral column on both sides. Um, and it allows the sympathetic nerves to travel longitudinally up and down um, to get to where they need to go. Um, so it goes all the way from the upper neck to the coccyx bone. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Real quick, I just want to touch on reflexes. Um, you guys are probably familiar when you go to the doctor and they tap on your knee and you twitch a little bit. Um, that's a reflex. A reflex is considered anything that's a rapid, involuntary, subconscious stimulus response mechanism. So you don't have to think about it. It just happens. Um, and they're used in, clinically in order to identify any abnormalities um, in the pathways of the PNS. So reflexes are, um, are actually, they go through a neuronal pathway called the reflex arc. Um, so they don't follow a traditional pathway that goes um, up to the brain that requires conscious thinking. So you can see the reflex arcs um, can either be monosynaptic or polysynaptic. And the monosynaptic reflex means that 
um, there are two neurons and there's one synapse. Um, the synapse is the connection between both neurons. So in monosynaptic reflexes, the sensory neuron brings, um, brings the nerve, the stimulus through the dorsal root, comes in to the vertebrae, synapses directly on the motor neuron, and the motor neuron leaves out through the ventral root, goes right out through that same spinal nerve and goes to the muscle, and that's why you see the twitch. Um, and then in polysynaptic reflexes, you have what's called an interneuron. And an interneuron is basically a neuron within the spinal cord that allows um, the stimulus to be passed from the sensory neuron directly to the motor neuron, which also allows for the reflex to happen. Um, so other reflexes that are monosynaptic are the bicep reflex, the tricep reflex, and the Achilles reflex, which sometimes they also test at the doctor. Um, you can go to the next slide. So last thing I wanted to touch on is what's called the dermatome. And we might have talked a little bit about this previously, but dermatomes, you can see this fun little color chart um, of basically where um, sensory nerve fibers innervate a segment of skin, specifically a specific segment of skin. And it's associated with their a single spinal cord level. So you can see all of these segments here are labeled exactly with their spinal nerve that serves them. Um, so can you guys remember what route these neurons will travel to get back to the spinal cord? What, uh, what route of the spinal cord the, the sensory neurons will have to enter to the, to the spinal cord? Yep, dorsal. So I see a lot of people saying dorsal. That's correct. So like I said before, dorsal is sensory and ventral is motor. So that's, that's a big takeaway to take away from this. Um, and then so you can see these, the, it's pretty straightforward. The thoracic region really um, uh, stimulates its, its normal region that you would kind of expect. The cervical region is in the neck and it goes down the arms. The lumbar region covers really the anterior part of the legs, and the sacral region really um, covers the posterior part of the legs. And you can go to the next slide. So a patient presents to you in the ED with pain in his jaw and down his left arm with chest tightness. You do an EKG, which shows that he's having a heart attack. How can you explain why the patient is having pain in his jaw and arm? Can anyone give me a brief little point of why they think this would happen? Perfect, yep, so I'm seeing a lot of people say that they're controlled by the same dermatome and that is exactly the right answer. Um, you can go to the next slide, Brendan. So this is called referred pain and referred pain is basically when the the, bo the body gets confused of whether a pain is coming from a visceral organ or it's coming from somatic skin. Um, so in this situation, you, there's pain coming from the heart. However, the body is interpreting that as somatic pain, which can send impulses all throughout the dermatome of the spinal cord segment that's being stimulated. So yes, perfect. If you look back at this dermatome, you can see that T1, where the heart would be located, is innervated. The dermatome goes all the way down to the wrist. Um, and you can also see that some of the cervical dermatomes are inner, innervate up to the jaw. So you have kind of this, they're not exactly completely sure about the mechanism here, but your body's basically getting these impulses and it doesn't know if the impulses are coming from the dermatome or from the visceral organs. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, and that's about all I have for you guys. Um, I hope you guys find these slides as a useful resource to kind of look back on and and really take everything in and absorb it because it's really hard to to take all of this in at once. So if you guys have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to us. 
thank you guys so much for joining us again today. And for yeah, thank you guys. I just wanted to say, like, on behalf of the other Meco students, um, they're sad they couldn't join here today. But we, I did say this earlier in the beginning, but we do thank you guys for joining us every Friday morning. I know it's difficult, um, but we really hope you guys got something out of it. And yeah, just our passion for medical anatomy, I hope that transferred out to you guys. So when you guys all become doctors, try to give back by mentoring and participating in like these type sort of programs where you can actually share your passion and knowledge with the future. So I want to say